July the 7th. In a sense, it's as though you're right back where you started. Your company has assembled to listen to some final words from its captain before going into battle. In reality, everything has changed, of course. The captain is a different man than the bookseller from last week. Virtually every soldier with you is new to the front, and where there were once only fresh troops assembling for an offensive, now there are just as many wounded men in the area as there are healthy ones. Entire field hospitals have been set up simply to manage the casualties as they are shipped in bulk back to the rear. If before the area around Albert looked like it was getting ready for an approaching storm, now it definitely looks as though the storm has already hit. The brickmaker captain waits for a squadron of noisy BE-2s to fly overhead before he folds his arms behind his back and prepares to speak. A steady rain is falling and the water drips from the brim of his hat down onto his shoulders. It pools at his feet. You and the other soldiers of B Company face him. The dirt ground you're all standing on is slowly turning to mud. Man, he says, for many of you, the coming offensive will be your first taste of battle. For some of you, and here he means you and several other soldiers in B Company, it is a chance to settle an outstanding score with Fritz. Either way, we all have a chance to do our part in this great war. Having enlisted to prove to people back home that you weren't a coward, you now find you don't need a chance to settle any outstanding score with Fritz. It's your thoughtful nature coming through. You'd be just as happy leaving him alone in the hopes he'd leave you alone too, but this isn't really the time or place to say so. In any event, this captain seems to be trying his hardest to get you and the other men of B Company excited about the prospect of trying to kill Germans again. Your objective today is Throne's Wood, a forested patch lying about six miles east of Albert. There are numerous woods scattered throughout the front lines and they make for some of the toughest fighting. The uneven ground and the lack of clear fields of view make the territory easier to defend and therefore more difficult to capture. Last night, when you'd first heard you were going into Throne's Wood, somebody asked why not just let the Germans stay there and go around them instead. It seemed a sensible idea, you all agreed, and for that reason you knew it was out of the question. After what happened the first few days, the attack this time is going to be carried out very differently. The aim will be to surprise the Germans with the unexpected. Instead of a lengthy barrage that suddenly ends in time for your side to come up over the trenches and walk across no man's land, your battalion is going to creep out into no man's land and as close to the German lines as possible, under cover of darkness, careful to keep quiet. The mud is going to be a problem, but again, the enemy might likewise think the rain will keep you away. Then, an artillery barrage will commence, but will stop after just 5 minutes. It won't last long enough to have any chance of actually destroying the German fortifications. Its sole purpose will be to lull the Germans into thinking that the barrage is yet another hours or days long affair, just like every other one before it. When it suddenly stops again, and your side rises up and storms their trenches, running as quickly as possible, the Germans should be caught completely unaware. They'll be hunkering down to wait out the coming shellfire, just as British soldiers swarm over their positions. That's the plan anyway. Also, unlike last week, this time your battalion's four companies will be advancing across a unified line. With surprise being such a crucial component of the attack, there's no point holding two companies back in some sort of second wave. Instead, the idea would be to get as many of you as possible into the German lines as quickly as possible. Steal yourself. July 8th. By 3 a.m. the battalion was deployed out in no man's land, only a few hundred yards from the German forward trench. Now it's waiting for the signal to attack. To everyone's relief, the deployment went off smoothly. The Germans don't seem to have any idea you're there. The only soldier, not relieved, is a private near you who had a 
premonition during the night that he was going to die today. Only four hours until I copied, he lamented to nobody in particular. By 5 a.m., the sun has come up and you're pretty sure you can make out the golden light reflecting of the Virgin Mary statue on the church back in Albert to the west. It's like a lighthouse floating in the middle of a meadow. Just then, a rumor spreads down the line that the attack is going to be called off. There's no cheering only because nobody is allowed to make any noise, but the hushed whispers and not so subtle eye movements send the message all the same. The private with the premonition of his death seems especially happy. Not for long, however. You can see the brickmaker captain in frantic motion to his adjutants to remind them that the attack is still going ahead. It's just another false alarm. Then your big guns open up from their position well behind the lines. You hear the shells whiz overhead and you see them explode all along the German positions before the sound of the cannon actually firing reaches you. It makes for a surreal pattern of sound. You trust the artillery barrage will have its intended effect and send Fritz digging in for safety. Even a few minutes of it looks like something you'd rather never have to experience. Almost as soon as the shells start landing, they cease. Everyone knows what to do. I can't believe they're doing this again, you think to yourself as you watch the masses of soldiers rise up and race towards the enemy line. I can believe the bastards are doing it again, Morgan says by your side. God have mercy on them all. What they really need, you answer back, is some luck. All they've got on their side right now is surprise. If the Bosch don't know we're coming, then our boys have a fighting chance. Unbelievably, the strategy works. The enemy, expecting the barrage to go on for hours or days as before, is caught completely unaware. Waves of British soldiers pour into German lines. Individual firefights break out all over the place, but for the moment, the enemy resistance is disorganized and haphazard. Soon enough, the call comes for your help. Let's go, Morgan shouts at you, and the two of you race out and into the fighting. It makes no difference that you are putting yourself in danger even while unarmed. Whatever Morgan's background, you suddenly think to yourself, he sure is willing to face the music. Nobody can reasonably call him a coward. You reach the nearest casualty and are shocked to see that you know him. It's Perkins. Of all people, your friend from the train and virtually the only living person you still know from when you first arrived here. He's been hit by something big and is in a bad way. His leg looks completely shattered and his breathing is labored. A small trickle of blood seeps from the edge of his mouth. Calvin, Perkin says meekly, when you drop down beside him and try to tourniquet his leg. Morgan is unimpressed. He's too far gone, the Irishman pronounces. To him, Perkins is just another wounded soldier who is going to die with or without your help. The men with Perkins, however, the ones who called for a stretcher bearer in the first place, disagree. For godness sakes, one private says, he'll be fine if only you buggers get him to the ambulance. What would an Irishman know about medicine? The fighting has already started to pick up again. These infantrymen are needed up front. They are not supposed to be standing over their wounded comrades, let alone chatting with you about what you plan to do with him. So as they run off, you decide how to answer Morgan's assessment. Take Perkins back to the rear. Leave Perkins and move on to the next wounded man. Have Morgan see whether they are, there are any better candidates while I stay with Perkins. Wow, this is a tough one. No, I think take Perkins back to the rear. Another thinker. Let's have Morgan see whether there are any better candidates while I stay with Perkins. You might be right, you say to your Irish comrade. But let's not give up yet. I'll start work on my friend Perkins here, and you start looking for anyone we're missing. Fair enough, he answers, and he continues scrambling over the battlefield. Bang. You look over, once the smoke of nearby whiz-bang clears, 
and see that Morgan himself has been hit. He starts rolling around in agony, clutching his stomach, and it's quickly obvious that he's suffered a shrapnel wound. So now you're lying there with Perkins in front of you and Morgan within screaming distance, and you can really only help one of them. Perkins is fading and looks near death. Morgan is wounded but seems to be alert. Who do you help first? Oh wow. Um, Morgan. He's wounded less so he has a higher chance to survive. Triage. You rush over to your wounded stretcher mate and stabilize him. Fortunately, it turns out his shrapnel wound is less serious than it first appeared. Once Morgan gets over the initial shock of being hit, and you begin to apply some necessary bandages and medication, he's able to bring himself back to a more relaxed state. Thank you, he says. Then you look back at Perkins and can tell instantly that he has died. His lips are already going blue and the life has left his eyes. He must have passed away while you had your back to him. July the 10th. Two days later and you're still in this blasted throne's wood. The successful offensive of July 8th quickly bogged down in a muddy German counterattack. Your battalion took heavy losses, again. Then the Germans took heavy losses, too. Both armies caught their breath, battered and worse for wear, but still hoping for a breakthrough and still counting on badly needed reinforcements that might make all the difference. Around this time, a major came through to inspect the lines, saw the horrible conditions you and the other men were in, and left without saying much of anything. An hour later, word came back that the next day's rum ration was going to be withheld owing to a general failure amongst the enlisted men to adhere to army regulations regarding proper grooming of facial hair. Holy hell. The ground gets slightly higher to the north and east of Ronwood, which unfortunately is also where the Germans are. <laughs> Their machine gunners especially have taken advantage of the higher ground. It also started raining yesterday and has not let up since. Whatever the ground looked like before, it is now impassable, and the wood you're in is even less of a forested place than it was before. Actually, if some of you have watched the documentary about World War I, sometimes the mud they're describing here was so incredible that soldiers had to walk on wooden planks, and if they somehow slipped of these wooden planks that they laid ahead of them, they would drown in the mud. So I can imagine this is not a laughing matter. The only queen wood that you see is the material being used to make coffins. Planks sit piled high along the roadway, in between some ornaments and some empty tomato cans, and beyond are some coffins already constructed. They sit there, empty, and even though they're only being used for senior officers and other notable casualties, their numbers, nevertheless, leave you slightly breathless. There are also a handful of other boxes on one side. Unlike the coffins, which are immediately recognizable for their shape, these other boxes are much thinner, too thin, by far, to hold a person. Instead, they're just various sized rectangles. These thin, wooden rectangles sit in their own stack and are clearly not being used to transport human remains. What they are, however, you don't know. There doesn't seem to be anything living in Throne's Wood that would make use of these crates. Huh, wooden rectangles. I can't guess what it is from this description. By the way, did this... I think it lowered our thinker stat, uh, the last encounter. Which is not to say Throne's Wood is empty, however. Far from it. In addition to the thousands of soldiers fighting, there are objects vastly more macabre here as well. The solitary, silent trees may be gone, but countless dead bodies lie in their place, their final forms frozen in varying contortions of agony and suffering. Clenched fists rise up from the sodden earth, shattered arms and legs dangle oddly from earthworks and ruined carriages. Heads, shoulders, and torsos, often unconnected to one another, lie scattered and strewn across the cratered landscape, 
rats have begun to appear, drawn, no doubt, by the plentiful food supply. In the daytime, it's an unpleasant sight, and nighttime, when the visibility is limited to what little you get from a few small fires on the stark rays or the stark rays of a very light, the visions can be almost too much to bear. It's like living within a mass burial pit. Oh god. You've been assigned to an overnight duty to tend to any casualties that come in when the armies are sleeping. Of course, the armies never actually sleep. Nighttime is one of the best times to get things done. Whether dig new trenches, shore up existing fortifications, or go out on patrol. Enemy shelling can come at any time. Firefights can break out, men can be hit, explosives can go off. Terms like quiet and pacified take on relative meaning in a place like the Somme. At the moment, however, things really are quiet. There's nobody operating in your sector, and Fritz seems entirely occupied with matters elsewhere. So it comes as a jolt when you suddenly glimpse a lonely soldier standing about 30 yards in front of you. He's out in no man's land, a helmet sitting loosely on his head and a rifle hanging from one hand. It's far too dark to make out his face, but you can instantly tell from his appearance that he is one of yours. He's not moving, he's simply staring at you. How did he get there? He stands there for a few beats longer, he's silent and motionless, his head now tilted slightly forward so that the brim of his helmet covers his face. It's getting colder. Goosebumps start appearing on your neck and your arms. You're starting to worry. You blink a few times and could swear that the lone soldier who hasn't taken a step that you could see is now closer to you than he was a minute ago. You also notice for the first time that his face remains in shadow at all times even when the nearby trench lights should be illuminating parts of it. His dark figure contrasts with the shapeless mudscape around him, water drips off his helmet and onto his sleeves, though he doesn't seem to notice. Instead, he simply continues to face you. Finally, you shout a challenge and wait for him to respond. He doesn't say anything. All you hear are the same distant sounds. Anxiously, you challenge him a second time, this time raising your weapon as you do so. For an instant, your throat constricts and your stomach knots and you think you're looking at Perkins. He's dead, you remind yourself, and the momentary panic passes. This is someone else. Whatever your consciousness might be doing, it's not bringing Perkins back from the dead. Once again, the lonely soldier says nothing, though he does respond this time. He slowly raises his head to reveal his face. He has large, sunken eyes and a grin almost like something you see on a skull. He stands there, grimacing at you. Frightened, you instinctively back away, only to bump into a ladder behind you. You swivel around just to check what you've walked into, and then, when you turn back, the lonely soldier has moved again. Now he's almost in front of you, still standing there, still giving you a silent, coolish grin. There's also a new sound to go with the rain horses and artillery. A steady, high-pitched scream faintly but unmistakably fills the air, coming from no particular source that you can discern. Speak to him, he hasn't threatened me. Call for help, whatever this is, I clearly can't handle it myself. Run away, scream. Speak to him, he hasn't threatened me, so I'll do that. Who are you, you demand. In the most authoritative voice you can muster. Identify yourself, please. The lonely soldier just stands there, grimacing at you, frightening you even more. He raises one finger as if to say, no, not just yet. Then he pulls out a knife and with astonishing speed plunges it into your chest. The shock alone almost scares you to death. Shrieking, you try to pull away. You can see the sharp, serrated blade dive through your jacket and down into your body, and you swear you can feel the searing pain of the knife as it rips away at your flesh. It's only your mind playing tricks on you, however. 
because almost immediately you realize you haven't been actually stabbed. I haven't killed you, your attacker finally says by way of reassurance. His voice is measured, distant, oddly detached from the surroundings, like a recording being played by something right under the speaker's mouth. I can't, he continues. I'm not alive. I'm a ghost. Now you're even more bewildered than you were a moment ago. I'm not surprised. As if that were possible. What did you say? You ask him. You heard me, the ghost responds distantly, and as he puts his knife away, you can still feel the blade's cold steel on your skin. I'm a specter, a ghoul, a vision of the beyond. Death is my nourishment, so this place, he says this as he sweeps his arms around no man's land, is my garden. Think of me as a harvester, trying to find a balance between the quality of his crop and its quantity. Well, that's a new one. You're clearly in unfamiliar territory here. Before you can think it over any further, however, the ghost speaks again. I have almost run out of time for tonight. I am here before you now, because you're all alone. Better than nobody sees you with me. Last night, I stabbed somebody named Pepper in the back. Tonight, I've gone after you. I have one question for you, soldier. Why do you think I stabbed you in the chest with that knife just now? This is taking an odd turn, you think. But maybe if you answer his question, the ghost will leave you alone. How do you answer? I have absolutely no idea. To see how I would react. Because you are an ass. <laughs> to prove you are not real. Actually, to prove you are not real seems sensible. I certainly proved that point, did I not? As he says the word point, he waves the point of his knife at you. Yet as he talks, the ghost also moves closer to you. He begins speaking again, this time in a lower and even more intimidating voice. And yet you can hear me, you can see me, and, he says pushing you backwards, you can feel me. I am very real. He grimaces at you coldly, until your eyes instinctively glance away. And as you do so, he says something else. I'm here, in this nightmare of a place, because I was wronged. They say that's how ghosts come to appear in the first place, and I suppose they're right. The ghost seems to be getting ready for some kind of Shakespearean soliloquy. Oh, I don't know this word. Anyone care to explain? Everything your old teacher, Mrs. Pettigrew, ever talked about is now standing before you in real life. Who knows what this is about? A distraction, maybe? Do you want to listen intently to what this ghoul has to say, or stay focused instead on the scene around him? I ignore the ghost and watch the environment around him, or are you mad? I listen to the ghost that is speaking to me. I think that's a better choice. The ghost is of course still talking. I don't remember everything from my days among the living, but I do remember losing my life on the day I was to go home on a leave. There was another Tommy who hated me, just couldn't stand me, for some reason, and it had been that way since we were schoolboys together. So when I received permission to go home to see my firstborn son, he decided it was time my luck ran out. He was on watch that night. He slinked away to leave his mates exposed to attack, then blamed me for the cock up when Jerry came over and punched their tickets, said we'd agreed to change duty posts and that I'd relieved him. He even stole my extra putties and put them there to show I'd been present. Captain had me executed the very next morning. Oh my god, that's so awful. You're not sure what you're hearing. I'm Sorry, you say. The ghost nods. I was screaming my innocence right up until the moment the firing squad did their deed. All I wanted was to see my son. It wasn't like I had cold feet about returning. I can still see the bastard standing among the ranks, grinning as I fought for my wife, knowing that he'd stolen my wife from me. So after this happened, and he looks up and down at himself, and I found myself still out here, 
I've made it a point to try to help men get home, however that might be done. Suddenly, it gets much colder. I started with that grinning bastard, the ghost says ominously. You should have heard the screams when he caught on to what was happening. He wasn't grinning then. Then he disappears back into the darkness as though he were never there. All I wanted was to see my son. The sentries heard the commotion from your with the encounter with the knife-wielding ghost and immediately came running, weapons drawn. Of course, by the time they reached you, there's nobody else there. Just you, standing there by yourself, having to explain what you were doing. You think you've just seen a ghost, a ghost with a grudge, who stabbed you in the chest with an imaginary knife, then disappeared. <laughs> but it's one thing to think that. It's another entirely to admit it to some other soldiers, especially ones you don't know. How would they react? You're going to have to tell them something. The nearest sentry looks around, sees there's nothing but dirt and sandbags and wood, and quizzes you skeptically. What's all the fuss about then? he asks. The rise of way. Too much cream in our tea? <laughs> I thought I heard some jerrys. I'm not gonna tell them I saw a ghost and I'm not gonna punch people in the face. You keep the real experience to yourself. Turns out it was only a platoon of rats gnawing on a bone you offer. Sorry about the bother, lads. You hand each of them a cigarette for their trouble and let them get back to whatever it was they were up to. You notice one of the sentries look around furtively, as if to reassure himself that nothing more sinister was around, before following his mate back to his station. You need some sleep. Maybe you had already started dreaming? Soon, you're relieved of watch and head back to the rear to rest. Your mind momentarily begins to clear as though you are waking up from a particularly intense dream. Then you collapse down into the first empty fung hole you can find, nestled under the wall of a hastily dug trench and try to get a little sleep. There's another day of fighting ahead and you might be busy. As you lay out, you run your hand along the dirt wall until it reaches something unusually smooth. You prop up your head and look more closely in the dim light and can clearly make out a skull embedded in the earth. Well, really, it's the decomposing corpse of a German killed in a gas attack. Only the front of it protrudes from the wall, and as you behold this deathly object, you're struck by how the toothy smile looks almost exactly like the ghost's face that grimaced at you a minute ago. Even when you close your eyes, you can still picture it. So far, you've managed to survive 10 days of the Battle of the Somme. Congratulations for making it this far, and good luck in the weeks and months to come.